Welcome back. We're talking about the conflict in Syria, and joining us now is a man who served as an ambassador for two U.S. presidents, first to the United Arab Emirates during the Clinton administration, and then to Syria under George W. Bush, Ambassador Theodore Katif. Welcome to the program. Thank you. President Assad appears to be talking from a position of strength right now, and the rebels appear to be in retreat. Is that a fair assessment? I think it's a very fair assessment. Assad and his troops uh, have been winning a number of uh, uh, key battles along the Lebanese border in the uh, Midland city of Homs, uh, which has been the, one of the epicenters of the revolt. Uh, and so he seems to be consolidating his grip uh, on some of the most populated areas of Syria. Where does that leave Western policy, particularly U.S. policy? Well, the U.S. Uh, may, be, uh, it may be too little too late uh, because we're now hearing that uh, working with Saudi Arabia and perhaps others, some of the rebel forces are, be given, are being given anti-tank weapons uh, for the first time uh, rather than having to capture uh, weapons and use them from the Syrian forces. But you really have to ask yourself uh, if it's going to uh, uh, really make a, a significant difference. I would argue no. Right, because there appear to be really mixed signals coming out of the United States. And I think part of that is borne out by the fact that the U.S. doesn't know who they're arming right now. They're very reluctant to arm any of those groups because they could end up arming a group that could be very hostile towards the United States. No, that's quite correct. I mean, we saw in Afghanistan and then, you know, after the Russians were driven from Afghanistan, we found out we had armed groups, uh, including uh, Taliban fighters who had anti-aircraft missiles that could have been used against uh, either our aircraft or civilian aircraft and the like, and the U.S. had to go and buy them all up. Uh, so it's a very dangerous game for the U.S. to be arming some of these groups because you don't know ultimately in whose hands these weapons will end up. Right. With. So effectively, does that mean that the U.S. has rapidly run out of options? I don't know if we've rapidly run out of options because the number one option is diplomatic. Uh, obviously, the U.S. and Russia have terrible relations right now. Uh, and indeed, that may be one of the reasons that the U.S. is more involved with the rebels in order to show uh, the Russians that, hey, if you're not going to play by any known rules, we don't necessarily have to uh, uh, go along with your uh, interests in Syria. Right. I want to get to the Russian role in a moment, but when we talk about a diplomatic solution, is the problem here the fact that the United States and its allies might see this as a popular uprising, might see it as some kind of pro-democracy movement uh, in Syria right now, but the Syrian government sees it as terrorism? Well, the Syrian government has always characterized it as a, a bunch of terrorists, and they've done their, their level best to make it true. So they have uh, uh, been happy to see uh, uh, fighters from all over the region and Europe and the like who are jihadists and radicals flow into the area and start to seize the levers of power where it counts most on the ground uh, among the opposition. Uh, whereas I think the U.S. right now, when I was talking about a diplomatic solution, the U.S. hopes at least to get the opposition to a point where it occurs to the uh, supporters of Assad in Syria that they can never win uh, and they can never prevail again over the entire area of Syria, and thus they will agree to come to the negotiating table on a more serious basis and with the goal transitioning away from Bashar al-Assad's rule. Right, but is the problem right now uh, the fact that Assad has already called elections for June 3rd, presidential elections? It's, he will stand for a third term in these elections. Is he looking at just another element of legitimacy here to undermine whatever talks might take place, whatever moves might be made towards any kind of power sharing agreement? Yeah, I think you've described it quite well. He. Uh, he knows very well uh, there can't be free and fair elections, although there's never been free and fair elections in Syria since his father came to power and even before. But he wants to uh, demonstrate that he still has legitimacy. And indeed, among his own minority group, the Alawites, among many Christians, other minorities in the country, he's seen as the uh, best of a bad lot. So when the United States looks at what kind of options it has in dealing with uh, Syria, what will it be looking at right now? Is Saudi Arabia the only option that it has? Well, right now the United States does not have a lot of good options. The Saudis seem to understand, particularly after Obama's recent visit, that we can't tolerate 
the arming of radical groups. Moreover, the Saudis also, out of self-interest, don't want to build up groups such as al-Qaeda uh, that want their overthrow. So I think we and the Saudis are seeing eye to eye more than we have in the past, but I think, as I said at the very beginning, uh, it may be too little too late, and the more legitimate opposition uh, may be beyond salvaging on the ground. There appears to be another problem for the United States, and that is there is a perception, and I, I, and I repeat that there is a perception, might not be reality, that the United States is reluctant to get involved in any kind of foreign conflict, especially after its experience in Iraq and in Afghanistan as well. I want you to take a listen to what a opposition Republican senator said about Syria. Let's, uh, sure. let's watch. The wisest thing that Assad did really was to kill 1,200 people with chemical weapons because in essence we said don't embarrass us any more that way. You can go ahead and kill another 60,000 people with barrel bombs and, and another, by other means, but don't embarrass us. Okay, that's one viewpoint. What do you make of it? Well, that's a little too cynical for most people, I think. Uh, you, you stated it correctly. The Obama administration does not want to get bogged down in another Middle Eastern war. And in fairness, I know of no country on this earth that wants to put boots on the ground in Syria. Uh, and in order to really sort this thing out, you would have to make a commitment to put tens of thousands of troops on the ground and referee this thing uh, and prevent massacres and the like, and you would end up taking casualties and it would be a huge mess. So no. The Obama administration doesn't want to do this. In terms of what Senator Bob Corker said, uh, it's true that uh, uh, Assad bought himself some time with the U.S. because now he is shipping his chemical weapons out of Syria. They say that 80 percent of the weapons, chemical weapons, have already been uh, shipped out of Syria, and uh, we want to see this job finished. The truth, the dirty little secret is, is the U.S., as much as it would like to see Bashar al-Assad out, uh, is not ready to see uh, either a failed state or a jihadi-led state in Syria. So the U.S. administration is on the horns of a dilemma. Let's get back to something you said earlier on, and that is the role of Russia in this. Um, could Russia's role in future be detrimental to the United States, given these tensions between Moscow and Washington right now over Ukraine? Well, I would argue that Russia's role in Syria has already been very detrimental. Uh, and that they are essentially backing the regime and backing Bashar al-Assad. But Lassen. Russia did broker that chemical weapons agreement, didn't it? It did, but it also did that because uh, uh, it did not want to see the U.S. Uh, hit uh, its ally Syria because we wouldn't have just struck at chemical weapon depots. We would have probably hit airfields and aircraft, the very things that give Assad an advantage in this war against the opposition. Right, but strategically, could we see Russia get or gain more influence in the Middle East now because of these differences with the United States. For instance, influence over Iran, influence over Lebanon, particularly Hezbollah, influence over other militias who are fighting on the side of Assad. Well, the jury remains out on that. Certainly, if the Russians want to go down a dark path, they could do so. I don't see how it benefits Russia if Iran gets a nuclear weapons capability. But if they want to throw a spanner into the talks with Iran, they could do so. In Syria, they've already to my mind, assured that Assad is not going anywhere for now. He may never again be the president of all of Syria, but he is entrenched in the capital and in a, several other major uh, areas of the country. Right. I mean, apart from nuclear weapons itself, I'm talking about Russian influence over dissuading uh, Iran from continuing its support for Assad or perhaps moderating that support, also asking Iran to stop supporting Hezbollah, stop supplying Hezbollah with weapons. But even before this latest crisis over the Crimea and Ukraine, uh, there was no evidence whatsoever that Russia was going in that direction. Uh, it seemed content to see Iran backing uh, Assad and uh, having Hezbollah at Iran's beckoning helping as well. The United States faces a whole host of problems throughout the world that it has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, is Syria no longer a top priority? You know, you're, you, you make a very good point. Uh, we're talking about Iran's nuclear weapons, the Ukraine crisis, and what Putin really wants, what he's after, uh, the South China Sea, the problems between Japan and China. Uh, so there are many huge problems uh, in the world. And you can't say that it's not a priority because it won't, it can't be ignored. The humanitarian aspects of this war are so awful. Uh, One-third of all Syrians displaced 
uh, and not living in their homes, uh, that the U.S. has to stay uh, involved diplomatically and on a humanitarian basis. And it also has to try to ensure that Assad doesn't go back to using chemical weapons or, other, or commit other crimes against humanity, as he's done in the past. Ambassador Khatif, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. When we come back, the view from the Assad government and the opposition when the heat continues. Stay with us.